Okay, so uh, the main uh, agenda for today's session is um, I'll be, I'll try, but I, I doubt we'll succeed, but uh, this is the broad scope of what we're going to try and do today. <clears throat> First of all, um, I will um, give you a quiz, uh, a mock uh, for the final. Um, yeah, and um, the second thing I'm going to do is after uh, you quickly attempt it, um, I will explain how uh, we designed the mock, or rather how I designed the mock, I should say. Um, I had to get approval as well. Um, so they just let me know a few minutes ago that they, they, I have to go ahead to uh, give you a mock. And maybe uh, I might even be able to put it uh, through a, a email announcement on portal with the link to the mock. Um, once you attempt the mock, I'll explain the process of how we did it. Uh, the reason uh, we decided that it would be a good idea to know how we constructed the mock is because it's actually something you might be able to use in your other courses as well. Um, and so we thought uh, that might be uh, helpful uh, uh, for anything you do in the future as well. Uh, the third thing, uh, if we still got time, and I think we will, is I'll uh, at least go through the first three modules. Um, uh, I'll give a quick overview of all the important topics and terms. And hopefully if we cover three, three topics each uh, session, because there are three sessions left, including today's session. Um, we'll be able to cover all of TDS uh, and what you require for the end term. Uh, one thing I will say is don't be afraid of the end term. There will be more questions than were there in the past couple of terms. So you, um, it will um, take you more time to complete it. But again, all the questions are always, um, because TDS is a very practical course. So when you ask questions, either MCQ or MSQ, um, they tend to be either you know it or you don't know it type of questions. So it's very quick to answer them. So my advice is for the end term, uh, answer TDS first if you've got multiple subjects uh, because you will get more time for the other subject. That's what I did when I took TDS. Of course, there were less questions when I did it, but um, I still think that is true in terms of a strategy for uh, doing your end terms, okay? Are there any questions before I uh, share with you the uh, mock quiz that I want you guys to attempt today? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, I'll put a rough timer, okay? Um, there are 40 questions in this mock and um, I'll uh, put the timers Say for 40 minutes, would that be okay? One minute per question? Yeah, we should be fine. Okay. Okay, just give me a second here while I bring it up. I do apologize. Uh, there are lots of other TAs in the room. So if you hear any disturbing sounds, uh, I do apologize for that. So I deployed a, a mock um, yesterday as well, uh, not yesterday, sorry, on Sunday as well. That was a little precursor to today. It was just to test out the concept. Uh, and so there were 20 questions. We had done it at the end of the session. So I won't give you that one, um, but this one will be a little more comprehensive because um, it will be more in line with the pattern uh, we expect you to have for uh, for the final. Uh, so so just you... one question, Carlton. Is this a generated one or is this uh, from the previous years? Like May 22 had 62 questions. So No, no, this is not from previous years. This is using all the material that we have... Um, the, um, you follow the process, same process you're saying. Pardon? That you did for the end term. 
Yes, this followed the exact same process uh, okay. as we did for the end term. All right, um, great. The, there is some Fantastic. slight variation from uh, what the instructor himself did, uh, but uh, more or less it's the same thing. Got it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to paste it into the um, message window. And um, as soon as you get it, you can straight away start answering it. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is if you got any questions, feel free to open your mic and ask. Okay. It's not like a strict exam or something. There's no like ma bonus marks or you won't be graded in that sense. It has points. Uh, but, uh, if you've got any questions, just open your mic and ask. Okay. Carlton, just as you mentioned this bonus marks. So bonus marks, uh, uh questions have stopped actually. We were told some more than 10 or so many bonus mark questions will be there. But uh, the last one was very long time back. Uh, are you okay. planning to have any bonus mark questions or are you going to finalize the bonus? Yeah, no, no. There are no more bonus uh, questions. Uh, so that was it, whatever they had, whatever Anand had given before. So we need to answer those questions uh, in this session. Mm, yes, yeah. Uh, 40 minutes. I'll give you 40 minutes time. And as soon as that's finished. Through our uh, then, uh, portal. Uh, yeah, no, I'll put it in the I'll put it in the window now. You should be able to see it now. So please go ahead and give it a try. If you've got any technical issues with it, just let me know.
Sir, can I submit for every five minutes or ten minutes like that number out? Uh, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, you can submit at the end also. You don't uh, have to submit it every few minutes because I think you're only allowed one submission perhaps. I'm not sure. Let me just check. Um, let's see. Yeah, you're only allowed to um, submit one response. So just submit at the end. So number of questions are uh, subjective here. I mean, even though the options are objective, the question is subjective. So 
can we expect this in the exam as well um the questions in the exam will be a little will be much more robust because uh, the instructors themselves were involved in its framing so uh, this was done at very short notice because there was oh, a lot that of I yeah so oh, it no issues about that part i mean thanks so much for doing this it's it's like at least we get a flavor yes right yeah if you start ask me streamlit.txt what does it do i'm going to fail so i hope <laughs> it will so yeah but uh, so like for example just as an example uh, even though i understand the questions have not been vetted so uh, for example wh what is the first step that you do uh, in uh, oh, so let me read the question here uh, what is the first step in data cleaning for example now i, I would always look for duplicate data first but okay, okay. you have to identify missing information first right right, right. so so then that becomes a subjective thing right because according to me duplicate data will also have a missing data if it is missing so might as well yeah. remove duplicates first and then go for identifying missing values yeah so a but, question like this would never appear in the final that much i can assure okay. you <laughs> okay great 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 thanks but there will be questions around data cleaning yeah, even if it is coming you will get they will say we will give mark for that later on yeah yeah but uh, i don't think that's how it's working in tds so far. you're yeah, not but, uh, the... but yeah but this kind of question is very very unlikely to come in the final no no i you understand know. i'm just talking about the concept um, i mean uh, the the approach in yes. forming the questions rather than the question itself yeah so what happens is uh, we created uh, so there are nine modules right so mm. we act so we uh, for the final we created uh, a new bank of 10 questions each for each module from okay. there we eliminated the ones that were uh, ambiguous or um, had issues with the question so we eliminated those and then only from the remaining set did we actually uh, randomize uh, question sets so whereas this particular one that was framed uh, was made from a much smaller pool and so therefore and it wasn't cleaned out because uh, i had no it was only me who was doing it so i had no time to actually clean it out but um, uh, so that's the reason you might find some questions that are not appropriate but it gives you an idea of what kind of difficulty and what kind of questions to expect yeah also if it is a msq if we select uh, instead of three you select two still it says wrong ah uh, yeah that's uh, just the peculiarity of uh, today's quiz it won't be like that in the final so finally you will get as usual you will get partial marks and things of that sort so another question uh, carlton just yeah. building on my earlier question is that uh, can we expect uh, which is specific to let's say syntax May I, are we going to discuss the answers as uh, Carl I mean, uh, Anupamji was telling no identifying missing values I don't know why it has to be the right answer uh, I mean, are, are I mean we... I'm not talking about that I'm talking more about uh, uh, like like I gave streamlit as an example uh, so expecting us to know the syntax of let's say geopandas and um, uh, you know nominatum and so on is uh, that uh, so uh, only at a basic level uh, i'll go see what i'll do is uh, over the next uh, three sessions we'll go over what you absolutely kind of must know and then okay. uh, beyond that uh, uh, you know if you if you if if you go over all the things uh, we talk about in the review then um, then you should be able to score very high uh, marks is my personal opinion so, uh, so i don't know so what else to say it? beyond that so no no that's great yeah what that's i mean that's more than what i was expecting so thank you for that yeah so that's what we're going to try and do uh, as much as possible we'll go over all the things that are valuable for you in the, from an end term perspective rather than from a knowledge perspective Sir, like I have already forgotten everything, like it's very vague. So if I follow all the three sessions for revision, so it would be enough because I have other subjects as well. 
Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, we that's that's our goal to make you prepared for the final as best as we can. So, so we let would I score it. good then? <laughs> Otherwise, I have to go again. Uh, uh, I, I mean, because I wanted to score good also. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it is the person taking the exam, right? But we will prepare yeah. you uh, with a view towards the end term. It's the same way how we prepared you for ROE, right? We prepared okay. you uh, yeah, uh, yeah. as best as we could for the ROE. <laughs> Preparation of ROE, okay. Uh, final day was the best one when you told uh, it will be a uh, uh, MCQs. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best preparation we had. Okay. Select all yes, these get fifty percent. <laughs> well, I'm glad that worked out. Yeah, for many, but uh, okay, it's always a normal curve. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, are we going to discuss these answers? Uh, uh, not particularly. Uh, I think more important. Uh, so the quiz, the purpose of the quiz was to give you an idea of the distribution, the difficulty level, uh, the kind of questions you might get. Uh, most of them uh, are, I think, are self-explanatory. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll explain how we generated the quiz because a similar method was used to generate the end term exam as well. So uh, I'll explain that first and then I'll go over the first three modules uh, today. Okay. If someone is desperate to know the answer, why something is the right or wrong answer, then I'm happy to answer those, but we won't go over every question because that will just take too much time. And I don't think it will be that helpful. Yeah, yeah, no issues. And uh, you, you, we just put that question in the chat GPT to give the answer. With yeah, the exactly, exactly. That's, that, okay. that's what I would So I'm just going over a few things here uh, while the okay. others are taking their exam, right? Sure, so, sure, sure. So it's not to not... waste time. Yeah. So, for example, data lakes is not a data source. And what's the purpose of a data lake? It's a data source only. Sorry, say that again. See, the answer is saying that data lake is not a method of sourcing data. Uh, so, so data, ideally, I mean, uh, you can say that data lake is a method of storing data. And so it is not sourcing data, but you do use data lakes to source data. Right, because that's the reason that right? they are they are meant to store data and which you can retrieve. Oh, data links. Oh, right. The, you're talking links. about Excel. Excel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, so data that's lake. he's talking about L A K E L A K E, which oh, are right. following the methods of data. I mean, sourcing data, web scraping, oh, right, right, right. data, data lakes, crowdsourcing. Okay. Um. Yeah. I mean, just. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm just discussing here, uh, Carlton, yeah, till yeah, people yeah. are doing their exam. After that, sure, I'll just sure. keep quiet. And yeah. the other one is, uh, I, I did get that. Uh, I, I noticed I got that removing duplicate wrong. Identifying missing value has been put as number one. OK. So I also yeah. got uh, my first two is also removing duplicates only. OK. So the key takeaway from those two questions is there will be questions on sourcing of data. OK, that's the first takeaway. It won't be as uh, problematic as that question you just saw. And um, again, with the second question um, about uh, uh, what uh, to do. Yeah. Again, the takeaway is there will be a question from that uh, aspect, data, uh, how to handle missing data and things of that sort. There will be data cleaning. There will be some question around that, but it won't be this question. And in, fact, in fact, none of these questions will actually ever appear in the final. That much I can tell you. And another thing I'm seeing is uh, this is a Google issue. It has changed some of my answers. At least one I'm seeing clearly where it marked decision tree and it's marked hierarchical. That oh. may be either, no, that may be because I inad inadvertently, I guess, pressed while reviewing my questions. I may, I don't know. Okay. So that, that's the first I've not heard that before. But okay. okay. No, that must be then a quirk from my side, I guess. OK. Attention mechanism, OK, I didn't know that. I just have to read up on this. 
what are the challenges computational data model interpretability why is model interpretability a challenge in training llms in interpreting the output of the model or interpreting the model what does that mean uh, the question is what are the challenges in training llms so i put computational cost and data privacy i did not put model interpretability just have so what would model interpretability mean in this context okay i think still people are attending it uh, uh, one thing i don't know whether we can discuss start discussing or not uh, uh, but can we check up carlton how many are still trying to attend or how many have already submitted so at the moment i have 10 responses okay so still 30 to 10 to 12 people are still uh, attending it mm-hmm. yeah 11 responses now 11 responses okay and too many msqs i did not click on a lot of answers just so that i don't lose marks yeah yeah but uh, i think these msqs are sort of all or nothing i think so yeah you know that's a different thing i'm like i'm just thinking if it's in the finals i'll probably yeah, lose yeah. one mark per msq that's the sure. rate at I which mean, i'm getting losing numbers yeah yeah just uh, yeah just follow good practice in the final i mean this is not the uh, not the mechanism through which the final will be delivered anyway but uh, the key takeaways are uh, these are the areas uh, you'll have to pay attention to in terms of uh, what to expect in the final and the kind of difficulty level you might see now this is a fair uh, this is a fair way of looking at it yeah could have been more specific a bit more specific but i'm sure that will happen in the final anyway yes uh, the final the questions will be much sharper excuse me carlton uh, uh, yeah just a second the other thing i was going to mention is there is likely so one thing that was not put in this uh, data set is there are no css and html questions but there are likely to be some css and html questions in the final and it will be similar like to and it will be similar like to week, week sorry it will yeah, 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 be similar to week 2 ga so like css and html for the purpose of uh, beautiful soup kind of questions or just independent css and html questions uh they will be largely for data uh, scraping uh, purposes so you know in ga2 there was um, some questions regarding uh, us using selectors so uh, there will be some so you'll be given a little bit of code uh, and then you will be uh, asked to which selector would you use yeah. to okay. so got it yeah i saw so that go- in may 22 may 23 paper that you know they're given a code and then you have to tell that if you want to extract the highest temperature of the day so what what will you give as an input yes. which span so, and which class and so on and then what yeah. selector will you use to extract that information that's what you're talking about yes correct so it will okay. be that sort of questions so i haven't put those in here because um, uh, partly because uh, it's more t- uh, difficult to construct that properly with uh, you know and so that's why i haven't put it in the mock but i'm just letting you know in advance there's likely to be questions uh, uh, like that in the final right so do you mind if i share this um, mock question link ahead yeah you can go ahead and share it there's no, no issues okay yeah the other thing i was also going to mention is um, in one of the ta sessions uh, earlier in the term we had done a, a good review of that it's one of my sessions uh, and i think many students found it very helpful so i would advise you to just uh, view that session where i have specifically talked about css selectors so that will probably be very helpful i will do that thank you dalton there is a question here that what is the purpose of data normalization and the mm-hmm. correct answer is to improve the performance of machine learning model so what does normalization refer to in this context okay uh, normally normalization is used for um, keeping everything within a certain range so i um, selected uh, to reduce data redundancy from the dbms concepts <laughs> no 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 that's a different type of normalization 
again, such a question is unlikely to be asked because this is tools for data science, right? So you will not be expected to, uh, from a tools for data science point of view, you will not be expected to know uh, about normalization. It's mostly a, you know, normalize, there are different kinds of normalization and we never really discussed normalization in, uh, in tools for data science. So you won't find a question like that. Okay. Okay. Uh, because there is a normalization of ranges, there's normalization from a DBMS perspective. Uh, so I don't worry about normalization. So let's see how much time is left. Uh, there's roughly about 13 um, minutes left. Is anyone else still doing the, um, doing the mock? Please uh, raise your hand or let me know verbally, open your mic and let me know verbally. Okay, there are still a couple of people doing the mock. Okay, no worries. Because if uh, uh, means, uh, uh, finished the mock or uh, doing mock, uh, thumbs up they are given to people. I think they're just uh, a way of raising their hand, I suppose. Okay, okay. Yeah, person ask, please, who are writing the mock? Yes. Raise uh, my thumb. Yeah, no worries. No worries, no worries. 40 minutes. Yeah. And uh, because you've uh, had 40 minutes, remember the exam will be about one and a half hours. So there'll be roughly between 40 to 60 questions. So you have an idea of how quickly you can finish. So it's still my recommendation to do TDS first, if you've got it in a set of with, you know, if you've got another subject as well. And if only one subject is there, then it will be two hours. <laughs> yeah, then, then you'll be able to... Yeah. Time. Go for tea early. <laughs> okay. If it is a morning session, we have to see. Can I get today's live recording? Yeah, the it is being recorded, so we will uh, we will uh, post it. It will probably be available tomorrow on the TBS channel. <laughs> we have got 15 responses so far. So there's a, another 10 minutes left. Sixteen responses. Anyone still doing the mock? Please put a thumbs up so I can see. Okay, one, two. So while we are waiting, uh, I can in fact start talking about uh, to save time. We can start. I can start talking about how this uh, this particular mock was made, as well as uh, how the end term was created. So one of the things we were uh, working on this term, uh, and it started right uh, during the break uh, before the term started, was um, we were training a um, Chat GPT uh, virtual assistant. So the idea behind it is it's a virtual TA. Uh, and we were hoping that we would have been able to deploy it for the students so that uh, you could actually ask the virtual TA help with the understanding concepts or 
um, trying to do uh, you know any of your uh, tedious work and uh, it was trained using it was the context that it was given is that we uploaded all the course material to the gpt and um, so it has the bank of everything that is required in terms of knowledge but it was also given some uh, parameters uh, to restrict it from directly answering any gas you had so it would not directly answer you know say for example if you put in the ga question it should not give you the answer to the ga but rather it will give you helpful advice like a ta would on how you could go about solving it. Uh, so this uh, trained gpt is uh, one of the primary tools we use this time for creating the end term question bank uh, i'll uh, go over uh, what i did for today's uh, mock itself so i took inspiration from the from the fact that it that the end term was done that way and i gave it some prompts uh, let me see if i can pull that up here and i'll share it on the screen so this uh, tds um, gpt is not yet available for students okay yeah unfortunately it will be available for next terms students and Okay. And also, let me pull up the. Just give me a second. I've uh, not yet shared the screen, but. Uh... Okay. Yeah. These two things will be useful. Uh, let me see if the responses. Eighteen responses. So I think everyone's finished, right? Is there anyone else uh, doing the mock? Can you give me a thumbs up? Okay. Uh, Sian is still doing the mock. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. I, 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 I thought you said we're done. That's why I gave the thumbs up. Sorry. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So I think everyone's done with the mock, which is great. All right, so I'll share the screen now. And so I don't know if you guys can see this clearly or not, but this is the prompt uh, that's been uh, given. Uh, this is only one of the things that have been, but this gives you an idea of how we train the, the GPT. So these were the instructions that were given to it. Um, and uh, of course, uh, there was a lot more training that was done during the term break. Uh, but this was kind of the prompt, main prompt that it was given. And then we were asked to test it uh, throughout the term and things of that sort. Um, as far as the prompt I gave it today, um, this, is the, this is the prompt I gave it. So this is the tedious. Um, um, GPT. So if I show you here, so it's IMTS, TDS Teaching Assistant. And my guess is uh, at some point, the portal team will incorporate uh, these sorts of uh, chat pots for many of the, the things that they want to do in with regards to the online degree. So uh, the prompt I used today, I'll just show you here. Uh, this is the prompt I give it. Create 40 questions, nine modules, give it a balanced representation, mix of MCQs and MSQs. Uh, and this template has already been provided in, uh, I think if you remember in one of the LLM sessions that we did, I showed you how we can uh, give it templates uh, and create, uh, ask it to give responses specific to templates. So if you watch that session, you'll understand what this means. So then we can just give it a prompt and it will be able to generate exactly the templates we're looking for. So one of the things that was uploaded, I didn't upload it, but it was uploaded by whoever trained the model, either the instructor or the professor. Um, they gave it the through an API call, they sent in the templates, the course material, all those things have been uploaded into the uh, GPT. 
and uh, then it produces what we require. Uh, some cleanup is needed, uh, of course. Uh, so some some human intervention is still required, uh, but this is generally the the broad idea. But then to convert. So, sorry, a question here. So uh, when uh, Professor Anand said that we can use this to generate our own mocks, so yes. what was he referring to? So um, I'm I like talking you, the next ten days kind of thing. Yeah. So I think you've been given. Uh, some tokens, right? Uh, you probably still have some balance left on those tokens. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of balance there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, API calls are cheaper than using uh, than using uh, Chat GPT directly. So you could use uh, this kind of prompt. Uh, and uh, the so, other thing I was going to say is you need to upload um, to the uh, GPT uh, the course material. So the question is, where do you get the course material from? So one yeah. of the places was, um, I think I recently shared in a discourse, um, where was it? Something similar to this. It won't be exactly this. But there was um, um, all these um, uh, markdown files, which had all the course module information in there. So these are the sort of things you can upload uh, to the GPT, of course, minus the videos. The other thing I was going to mention was uh, one thing that is not shown in the prompt. I don't know if you can still see my screen. You can still see my screen, right? Yeah, sir, no, sir if, if one of our uh, students or our faculty members upload this one, can it be used by all uh, in chat GPT or uh, everyone has to? Um, so you all have an individual API key. So uh, the question is, no, no, Carlton, the question is that mm -hmm. if this has already been uploaded, et cetera, et cetera, by the instructors, yeah, do we have access to that upload uh, GPT or do we have oh, to, to now do our own uh, right. Okay, to this particular GPT you're talking about. Um, yeah. I can ask Anand, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if students have yet been given access to this uh, particular GPT. The idea was to roll it out for all students to use it. Uh, but I'm unsure if that has been done yet. Yeah, because if, if this happens, then it is easier for us to, then I, the prompt engineering is our headache. So we yes. can figure out. Yeah. But the I GPT mean, by itself, the upload would be very helpful because then yes. we can play around a bit with it. Yes. So I'll raise that with him. The second thing I wanted to mention was, this was not the only thing that was sent it. So one of the jobs I had to do earlier today, not today, sorry, uh, um, before before this, was I had to scrape all the, um, so you know, we have lots of videos, right? So what I did was uh, get the transcription of all those videos and um, uh, put those transcriptions into the, um, into the um, LLM. So I'll show you what it looks like. Just give me a second here. Um, so, yeah, so these are the ones. And open it with the VS code. Okay. So, so this is an example of one of the videos I uh, transcribed. Okay. So uh, I created these SRT files, uh, which have timestamps, and you can see some text here, right? So this was all fed into the GPT, all the transcriptions of all the videos. So I sc uh, scraped this from the videos. And then these were these are in a structured format, as you can see. There is a segment number, a start time, and an end time. But what we actually put in there was these, this uh, continuous text. So it knows what uh, was contained. But if we do this, Carlton, won't we run out of tokens? Now, just a general query, not a. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, we have tokens. Yeah. So I'm just saying what I, I did, right? So that um, you understand the process. Um, but uh, like I said, I'll uh, check with uh, Anand if, um, if this is, GPT will be available to you guys or not, because this has already been uploaded into the GPT. Um, so, but the reason I'm mentioning all this is if you've got your own uh, GPT that you're running, this is the kind of process you would have to go through. Say, for example, you're preparing, uh, I don't know, MLF or something like that, or some other course, BDM or something, and you want to 
uh, create mock question papers or things of that sort this is the kind of work you'll have to do to get it uh, ready for yourself okay so that's why i'm just quickly going through it because it's um, i think it's useful to know uh, so once that was done and once i got this uh, question question bank or rather bank, uh, set of questions the next thing i did was i uh, i did a little bit of clean up so you can see some i put some asterisks so these are the ones uh, that are the answer keys okay um, so i uh, did that manually because i hadn't uploaded a template that specifically said make sure there's a star in front of uh, front of the answers so i didn't so i had to add these in manually uh, but perhaps you can upload a template that says says the same so once that was done the next thing is to host the the question paper right because that's what makes it useful as a practice um so uh, the next thing what i did is i wrote a script and uh, what the script does is it's quite simple it's to generate a, a google app script so if you look at the uh, google apps uh, let me get that over here and let me go to let's go so there's something called uh, apps uh, google apps script okay and what that does is you, you know all the um, various uh, like google docs and it has all these sorts of like uh, docs sheets they all uh, can be dynamically generated using a script so same way this form that i showed you guys or this quiz that i made for you guys was completely generated by a script so um, in order to generate this script i wrote an uh, application for it and so that's what this application does it takes this uh, um, question bank uh, i and it creates the script so it reads the file it splits it into the various segments because as you can see each uh, segment is separated by a blank line and then uh, for each segment uh, i have to add bits and pieces to the script i won't go line by line by what all this is uh, but rather what i'll do is i'll show you the end result of that script so that you get an idea of what's required in the script so first of all the form requires uh, you have to create the form uh, it's a java it's kind of a javascript uh, file so you create a variable called form and uh, form app is the actual uh, object that it has to a class rather and you have to create an object and this create and then the uh, name of the form and set is quiz you have to make that true the next thing is there are basically two types of questions in a quiz right there's multiple choice and there is ms quiz so for multiple choice it's add multiple choice item and for ms quiz it's add check box item these are the two uh, functions that you use and then uh, the questions get set up in this set title that's another function so each item in there someone asked a question Uh, tedious is by day very tedious in this term oh i'm sorry to hear that i was just hoping i mean is this useful for you guys to know if it's not then i'll just carry on uh, to come on forget uh, it i'll just continue okay so we're all uh, if we didn't find it useful you would have dropped off i know okay okay so uh, but it's very simple okay all you have to get your script to do is ask the set the title which is the question give it the choices and it's the same for whether it's multi msq or uh, 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 or uh, mcq okay it's this set choices and then you give it an array of the individual choices and false if it is not the correct answer and true if it is the correct answer so if you see here that's the that's the correct answer so that would be set to true and uh, that's it and then you can give it points so i gave one point for each question and this set required means you have to answer all the questions so okay or rather answer that question as long as it has these items you will be able to create the entire script that creates this uh, quiz and that's this is the final result of that and so it's super fast right uh, you just give it the prompt once you made the script now i can endlessly keep on making more and more question sets quizzes and you can actually Uh, try the quizzes out yourself right so you don't need anyone to make the quiz for you 
so that's you can do it for this subject and you can do it for many other subjects of course you can add more complex things you know you can add images and things of that sort but of course i haven't done that here but you can see the power of this right um, in order to use it as a learning tool so that's how this so, was uh, in this uh, in this code uh, there i think there is one mistake uh, whenever i am checking answers if there are three three or two multiple uh, correct answers then uh, marks should be distributed according to the number of answers suppose yes yeah yeah i agree uh, but i didn't uh, only I didn't... one answer is given out of two or three correct uh, answers yeah i, I mean that's uh, i i know that bug exists but uh, i did this this afternoon right so uh, there was a limit to uh, how quickly i could get this ready for you guys for today so i haven't done that debugging but uh, that is possible you can get uh, partial marks but uh, someone will have to revise the script and uh, get it to work correctly okay it's maybe an exercise for you guys after the end term <laughs> but uh, but yeah so that's what basically that's what the script does it goes through each line as you can see here it goes through each line in here and um, it uh, splits it uh, it splits it based on the question number and it splits it based on the question type so if you look here if it's got this mcq or msq yeah, it uh, automatically chooses the right uh, script to write okay and all it's doing is it's adding those items to the script and eventually the end result is this and then what i do is i just upload this i upload this script into the app script um all you have to do is say new project and then once you say new project it will give you this function my function it's called okay fill put your script in here and just run it once you run it it will uh, in google drive itself it will create a form so this was an earlier test form i had done and then this is uh, another form that it generated so that's all you have to do to make it uh, work otherwise you would have to manually enter all this in, and that takes ages whereas this just took just a few clicks of buttons of course i had to write the script that took a little time but once you have written the script now i can keep on endlessly generating many 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 quizzes without any issues so that's the that's how i generated and that's how the end term has been done of course the gen term uh, is a little more robust in its creation mechanism but this is roughly the idea behind it any questions so far no one takeaway is uh, within that nine modules only we will get questions correct whatever has been told in the videos if we could uh, remember everything you will get 100 correct absolutely right because it will be within the within those things and um, this is roughly the difficulty level you'll face so you will not i, I would not expect anything more significant than this uh, and so that's it Yeah. Sir, in our okay. lectures, have uh, you covered uh, we module six? I module six was uh, networks, right? Yeah. 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 There was a, yeah. There was there was a session on that. Yes. Not covered, sir. No, no. It is. It has been covered. Module six has been covered. Okay. In fact, every module has been covered uh, in the TA sessions. Okay. It will be on YouTube. okay so now that we have done with the quiz now we'll go over to um uh, going over the materials uh, by the way I, i hope you are all aware that on discourse there is a um, there is a um, post uh, which is pinned to the top i believe if you haven't checked already uh don't think it is on so see and it's this one over here no it's not the one so was it git repository private pardon it's the first ah. one the syllabus one is that ah syllabus? this one is it no no yeah. i was looking for the one where um anand sir has um given the um that uh, was not pinned i guess ah yeah uh, this one this you... one sorry sorry this one i think it was yeah so this this uh, repository is been made public this is not the same as the private version uh, but it is uh, available 
and um, this has all the um, first of all it has all the things that we have done through the term and it has all the um, python scripts for answering the questions uh, for your gas and um, it also has the javascript that generates uh, that parametrically generated the question and it also has the data source for those javascript files so i hope you, you guys are aware of that and then the second thing i wanted to mention was uh, about the syllabus so as uh, as mentioned here nine modules all videos roughly equal weightage which is what we saw in this mock quiz between 40 to 60 questions uh, and it will be all brand new set and you can see why it's all a brand new set okay and uh, now the next thing so any questions so far before i continue sir how many marks will be there like this on sunday also there is there is one, is there one more mock no no i won't generate another mock uh, because uh, what i want to do is cover the materials uh, that you will need for the end term so i'll cover all the topics in sufficient detail so that you should be well prepared for the and this is the mark that will be considered for bonus marks no no there's no bonus marks for this mock this was done by popular request there was a lot of students who wanted a mock and um, there wasn't one available and there wasn't going to be one available unless someone took the initiative to create one so i decided to make one for you guys so and i also needed permission to to actually uh, allow you guys to have it so it's not perfect as you can imagine because i just made it in one afternoon uh, but i hope it was useful for you guys uh, and i believe it is representative okay for what you will expect okay. so the next thing i want to do is uh, go over let me see if i have got uh, it's over here okay um so the first thing is uh, module 1 so if i let me okay so the basic idea is of course go over the videos uh, and um, you know i understand it can be a little time consuming but it's worth going over just play it at 2x uh, slow it down wherever you need to hear something again a second time just just do that at least once read all these little things that you see here because remember the gpt is going to have all this stuff in its brain right so uh, it will take all this and it has its own uh, data that it's been trained on uh so just make sure you have all this and the reason i say go through the videos is because all these videos i have personally um extracted the transcriptions from them and it has been fed as a training model to the gpt so anything that it extracts from here is all fair game okay uh the so uh, that's uh, with regards to module 1 so what are the key things to remember in module 1 uh three sources of data sets personal public private uh, let me make this a bit bigger so it's a bit easier to see can you see this clearly oh, yeah. yes okay. okay so three sources of data sets personal public and private data sets um and uh, in personal uh, data sets these are stuff on things that are on your own devices uh, they contain your uh, own usage patterns of things uh they primarily come from your mobiles or your laptops or any um sites that you use um and it comes from any personal logs that are uh, logged by these devices okay uh, sites that you visit etc etc uh public data sets uh, are um, it, although it seems like you would get a lot of information from public data sets and it seems that there there are a lot of public data sets actually there are more private data sets in the world than the public data sets and the reason for that is if you think about it every firm has a data set right every business has a data set uh, so uh, by the very fact that there are millions and millions of businesses and only like a few government bodies uh, private data sets will be the biggest in terms of data 
public data sets uh, the other issue is uh, they're not necessarily exactly the data you want see when you're asking a question right? so why do you need data sets because you're trying to solve a problem or you're trying to analyze something so sometimes you will get pub public data sets are easily accessible most of the time but it may have uh, lots of information uh, that are around the topic but may not have exactly the thing you're looking for so they're not uh, always what you're looking for and it's also not always in the format that you want okay so that's one of the issues of public data sets and um, some key data sets to remember so gdelt is uh, uh, if you want any current affairs gdelt is the place to go every year i think uh, they roughly generate 2.4 terabytes of uh, data on all current affairs all around the world from multiple sources so it's a great uh, data set another public data set is uh, gadm these are for shape files uh, and when i say shape files i'm not just talking about shapes of maps and things of that sort often times um, shape files are coupled with uh, tabular information so crime data um, economic data census data uh, these are all coupled with shape files so resource data you know where where uh, pipes uh, underground the pipes are laid where gas pipes are laid electric lines all these things are overlaid on top of shape files um, so to give you an example in um, in britain uh, whenever we want to um, so say for example you are at your home and you want to um, construct uh, a structure you have to first apply to the council for permission but uh, apart from that one of the other things you have to do is you have to apply uh, to the national grid to find out if there are um, any electrical cablings uh, underneath the earth you have to apply to also um, the gas uh, the national gas uh, company as well to see if there are gas lines running underneath uh, sewerage uh, so you have to get these permission from all these three organizations before you can actually build any structure so uh, again you will get a shape file um, and uh, and then they will uh, it will be overlaid with information so gadm is an important data source uh, government data portals these are ob obvious in nature that's another important data source kaggle uh, again important data source. google data sets awesome public data sets and data meet so data meet is unusual from these it's uh, mainly a community of data enthusiasts uh it's like a forum where you say hey you know uh, has does anyone have any information about this particular place because sometimes the data is not available in electronic format right it might be sitting in a in a book somewhere or in a register somewhere so to give you a good example uh in goa uh, because it used to be a portuguese colony until 1960s a lot of um, valuable community census data Uh, about who married whom and uh, uh, who lived where and whose ch whose children and all who died when who was born when all this is uh, available um, in documents uh, that uh, are available uh, within churches uh, in goa so uh, it's a quite a rich data set uh, because it also tells you the cause of death uh, and things of this sort of thing but they are not on a computer Uh, they are actually in a register somewhere sitting in in an office so you know if i need to find out about a particular community or a particular village uh, the best thing for me to do is get in contact with the priest over there and say you know uh, i'm doing some uh, data analysis uh, is can i you know uh, access this information or things like that so that's uh, that's what data meet is you basically contact other people and get data sets that are not necessarily sitting uh, e in an easily accessible place so that's uh, another way to get data then uh, private data sets these are the most common type but it's also the most restricted kind because they almost always inside organizations and if they are accessible to the public they are usually behind a paywall uh, it's the one that uh, is also the most invested in now you might think uh, why am i using all these terms again it's uh, these are good things to know okay uh, from an exam point of view uh, 
Um, so that's why I'm talking about these things. So uh, it's mostly corporate data. It's uh, it's uh, used. Um, it's invested in extensively. They are very detailed. They are very accurate. Uh, they are always to the point, right? They are usually solving some business problem. Uh, so they tend to be very accurate uh, and very very reliable. Uh, oftentimes more reliable than public data sets. And you can easily see why that is. So in say, for example, if you look at uh, national survey statistics of India, uh, where they go to various households and things, you know, it's uh, always a representative sample. Um, and, uh, you know, there'll be, say, so for example, 70% response rate, and there will be some error in that. Uh, whereas these will be very, usually very, very accurate. And they won't, generally, they won't be samples, all these things. They will usually be very, uh, very comprehensive, okay? So those are private data sets. So those are about data sets. The next thing I want to talk about is there are three types of data, structured, semi-structured, unstructured data. Uh, okay, by the way, before I continue any further, any questions at this point? If I'm going too fast, let me know, okay? So you're got, So everything's okay, right, so far? Okay. The next thing is three types of data. Now remember data lies on a continuum, okay? So it's not always very cleanly, it's not black and white. It's not like there's only structured, there's only semi-structured and there's only unstructured. It's a kind of continuum. Uh, sometimes, uh, and the reason I say that is uh, one good example is for example, spreadsheets, okay? It is generally considered structured data, uh, but a spreadsheet might have uh, unstructured data inside it, right? It's always possible. You might have a chart in there. Uh, so uh, things of that sort. So just keep that in mind that sometimes it is not so cut and dry. When shall we expect project one marks? I think project one marks have been released, haven't they? Can someone confirm for me? Yeah, they have been released. They can be seen on the dashboard itself. Okay, okay. Is, does that answer your question, Sanjeev? Okay, great. Mr. Maso, that is no, not yet released, sir. I couldn't. What do you mean by continuum? Like data lies on continuum? So, what, what that means is um, sometimes, so uh, uh, we may say something is structured data. Sultan, yeah. sorry to disturb. Sorry to. Right one marks, marks. Sorry, one at a time. Could you? Can I? Yeah, go ahead. What happened to the project marks? It's not yet released, no? Uh, I believe it's been released, project one. No, it no. Uh, it's not visible on the dashboard, but in the portal, when we go to the section of the peer review, we can see a marks over there. No, but my peer review, only two people did that. Third yeah. peer review, it was not done. So what is my marks? We don't know, no? In that okay. case, I think, according to the document, the TS will review. So I, yeah, we'll, I don't know about that. Yeah, so Carlton will be better person to answer that. Yeah, so, um, th I mean, that's exactly right. That's what will happen. Uh, generally, uh, if there are uh, issues with the reviews, then uh, at the end of the term, uh, you won't see them straight away because obviously uh, it's not possible for us to do it right now. But when the term finishes, we create uh, some lists. Uh, the backend team creates uh, lists of uh, all the projects, the review scores, and uh, they create lists where we have to um, go through uh, any anomalies. And then uh, we uh, do the reviews ourselves to see uh, you know, what the issues are, and then we assign a grade to it. So now it will not be visible, the marks. Yeah, for those that have not gotten all their three reviews, you will not see the marks now. It will be only after the enter. Okay, that answers it. No? Like it is not in the dashboard. Uh, yes. No, but my marks have been reviewed. My, my project has been reviewed by three people. But still, I cannot see the marks on the dashboard. Yeah, no, it will not be on the dashboard. I think they were saying that it will be when you go to the actual uh, portal page, it will be there on that section i believe i mean but it's in two parts no for uh, one for the submission one and other for the peer review so what is the final one 
Okay. Um, if it is, has someone been able to find their score on there? Okay. If no one has uh, score yet, then uh, yeah, then mostly what will happen is uh, it will only be available at the end of the term. I'll check with JK tomorrow if any of the scores. Okay. Avia can see her scores. So there must be scores on there for people who have had three reviews, I think. If there were no issues with your no, review. Carlton, again, sorry to interrupt. Uh, see, yeah. uh, before uh, this, they had the second review, no? Before that, the scores were available. How many marks uh, have, just like our portal. Uh, but mm -hmm. once you made that second review uh, active, after that, uh, the entire uh, format changed. It is not visible at all for the uh, okay. It's still yeah, I'll I'll inform the back end yeah. team that it is not the case. It still shows uh, the portal only, not the result. Right. Okay. I'll I'll let them know. Uh, they probably just have to push it to the front. That's it. Yeah, don't worry about second peer review. That was actually a tech for, for technical issues that some students faced. I think there were roughly 140 students that uh, had some issues with their initial submission. So only for them, the second review uh, or the second round of peer reviews was done. So for anybody else, it was, uh, it was a non-issue. Okay. Right. So I'll carry on if there are no other questions. Um, so three types of data. And uh, what it, what I mean by it lies on a continuum is uh, sometimes it's not clear cut, OK? Uh, and I give spreadsheets as an example. Uh, spreadsheets typically are considered structured data because you have rows, you have columns, and there are fields. Uh, but it can has unstructured data in there, right? So then would you call a spreadsheet structured data at that point? Uh, probably not. So if you get a question that says, uh, you know, um, there's a spreadsheet and it's got a pie chart in there, then how do you classify it? So in that case, uh, you know, it depends on what the question asks, but maybe it might be semi-structured or unstructured, right? Uh, most likely I would say semi-structured because there is some structure, but it's also got some unstructured data in there. So, that's what I mean by it lies on a continuum. That is, in other words, it's not it's not cut and dry always. It kind of depends on the context. Uh, what are some of the key um, uh, the key attributes of structured data? There is a schema. So by schema, what it means is there are some fields. Um, so for example, there'll be name, there will be uh, age or date of birth, address. There are some very specific fields for them, and uh, all of the rows will have those fields, okay? And then each of those are also uh, typically have very defined types as well. So for example, date of birth uh, will be like a date format. Um, um, a name will be a string format. Uh, height might be a, 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 a numerical format. So there will be some very defined data types. Uh, and sometimes it can be very narrowly defined. So there might be even a range as well. So height cannot be uh, less than, say, one foot and cannot be more than, say, seven feet or something like that, right? So it can be narrowly defined as well. Um, the second thing is uh, structured data uh, can have relationships between tables as well. So if there are two columns, uh, one column in one table, that's uh, the, um, say, for example, the ID. Uh, there can be another table with IDs as well, and those both can be joined on them. So then there's a relationship from table one to table two. So that's uh, those are typical of structured data. Where can you see this? In databases. You can see them also in spreadsheets, and uh, you can see them in shapefiles. So these are examples of structured data. Uh, the next thing uh, could be there could be semi-structured data. Uh, it may have a schema, but it's not always obvious. So for example, if you look at a PDF file with a form, right? So you typically have filled up forms before. So there might be some columns for names and things, and then there'll be a place for a picture. And uh, sometimes the things might be related or they may not be related. 
So it may have a schema, but it's not straight away obvious what the schema is. So you might have to extract the schema from it. So examples would be, for example, documents uh, like PDF and HTML and uh, even XML, you can say these are semi-structured. So there are um, um, there is some structure to them, but uh, uh, it's not uh, necessary for it to for everything to have the same structure. So even in an XML file, you know, you you might have certain tags somewhere, and then suddenly there are no tags for certain parts. Of, I mean, there are other kinds of tags for different parts of it. So it's not not fully structured. And inside those tags, there may be unstructured data. So a good example is HTML, right? So you will have uh, tags, and those tags will have very specific definitions to them. But then suddenly you'll get a blob of text, uh, or an image, or an audio file. So uh, those are good examples of semi-structured data. Same way with SM messages like SMS and email. Um, they have structure, but then inside them, there may be um, items that are unstructured. So the body of an email may be unstructured, but it's got well-defined bits as well, like when it was sent, who sent it, that sort of thing. A good clue whether something is semi-structured is, the, is they are in sort of container formats, what we call them container formats. So like zip files, docx. Uh, so that's an example of semi-structured. Unstructured is very straightforward. Uh, if you've got a whole bunch of text, that's kind of considered unstructured data like in a book or a title of a book, these are all unstructured data uh, because there's no relation or schema or anything like that. Images, unstructured data. Video, unstructured data. Audio, unstructured data. I hope you understand why it's unstructured, right? It's not, it's, uh, there's very little you can gain out of them. You, you, one of the main um, uh, aspects of data extraction involves converting unstructured to structured data. So for example, you may see how long an audio file is. You may do transcription of an audio. So you're getting structured data out of the unstructured data. Uh, and uh, a good example was this, right? Where is it? These uh, transcripts I was showing you earlier. So it was unstructured, the audio itself, or the video rather, and then, um, the um, the actual transcripts themselves had a structure to them, a semi-structured format to them. So it was useful for an LLM. So uh, that's a good example. You can still see it at Narayan, so possibly a score. Yeah, okay. So some people have got scores, but some people haven't, according to RJ. Okay, cool. Thanks, RJ. So that's about three types of data. Then the next thing is there are three I'm types. Sorry, sir, sorry to ask one question. Yeah, sure. So actually, in the um, guidelines, it is given that for best five out of eight uh, graded assignments will be considered. Yes. But after the sixth uh, assignment. No, uh, best five out of six in the graded, uh, the graded uh, in the document. Yeah, I think it is the previous term um, guidelines. Okay. Uh, maybe in the previous term, but this term's graded documents is best five out of six. Uh, Sandhya, you have a question? Yes, I wanted to know that uh, we consider shape files which have coordinates as structured data. Correct. But uh, you uh, said that charts which are there in spreadsheets, they are also made of coordinates. We don't consider them to be structured ones. Uh, why is that so? Um, I mean, they, they're not, they don't have coordinates, right? I mean, they are... Uh, I mean, a chart uh, like a scatter plot or uh, a histogram, they are made of points only? Uh, mm, I suppose. I mean, if you think of a line chart, right? So a line chart um, is continuous. Uh, and uh, although uh, various points along it will be very defined, um, the curve, say for example, if you're trying to fit something and it's a, it's a curve, then would you call that structured? Uh, maybe. Yeah, the chart itself, I mean the line itself would be structured, 
whatever we are trying to fix that may or may not be structured depending on what it is yeah um i'm not sure that's my, that's the best answer i can give will so, we have a question that says um uh our charts in a spreadsheet uh, uh semi structured or structured i don't think you have to worry if that kind of question will come it's unlikely you get that kind of but what i do know is uh, that it's possible for it to have unstructured data maybe the so, example i gave was not very good but um, so what yeah sense. that is what i want to know that what would be unstructured data in a spreadsheet um unstructured okay so let's say a spreadsheet had a review in there right you could have a row uh, with uh, very a product name product id all these things and then suddenly there's a review as one of the one of the columns but that review would be an unstructured would be unstructured right it's okay. just text uh, like the address field uh the address field would be um address field would be semi structured probably uh, because i mean again when we say data it, we are not talking about individual fields right we are talking largely about what it contains so um address will have some sort of structure to it right in terms of uh there will be a house number there will be a street uh street name a city mm -hmm. name so that would be a sort of semi structured data i think as an address okay but if it is of a particular area i mean the entire sheet contains of a particular area like india itself and in india say delhi itself then yeah. i think it would be structured but at that time yeah. because it mm, would be possibly yeah Any thoughts? Anyone else has any thoughts on that? You are talking about the reviews. No reviews can contain uh, uh, emojis. It can contain uh, yeah. so many things. It's not only and, the text. Yes, and it, and the thing is, uh, even if it just has only text, it, you can't uh, derive any metric from it, right? Unless you do some processing on it. So unless you say, for example, send it into sentiment analysis. to extract a value to give it a score until that point it is still unstructured right so it goes back to this point i was making about uh, the main part of data extraction involves converting unstructured to structured data so that is a work you would do right so yeah reviews even if it's only text it still has no value until you do some processing to it it would be completely unstructured until you convert it okay thank you thanks mm -hmm. lot so, so yeah. charts we don't consider as unstructured uh let me get back to you on that okay i'll okay. get a more definitive answer for you for next uh, next session all right okay. uh so that's about uh, these three types of data uh then the next um, uh thing is there are three types of values now remember this was about data this is about values themselves okay so this is the stuff inside the uh, inside a field so what kinds of values are there categorical numerical and composite what is categorical they usually labels you can do some limited operations on them uh, so so example true or false right so you can do some some operations on it you can do uh, yeah. and then uh because they can usually represented as true or false or ones and zeros or, or however you want to do it and one of the operations you can do with booleans is you can use an and operation on them or you can do an or operation on them but you can't do like mathematics on them right not not real mathematics on them so limited operations uh, another categorical would be unordered labels so like colors there's no order to colors uh, you know colors are just uh, labels then you have ordered categorical labels. so things like low medium high or uh, when you give a, a score in a review 1 to 5 1 star 5 stars so it has some sense of order but uh, you can't really do any mathematics you can't say uh, 2 plus 2 is 4 you know uh, you can't say two objects worth two stars is worth a single object worth four stars that mathematics does not make sense so you can't really do any serious operations other than ordering it so uh, 
ordered categorical uh, values are there then there are cyclical categorical values so like days of the week there is a sense of order uh, but um, it's cyclical in nature uh, sunday comes before monday uh, and uh, saturday comes before sunday but it goes in a cycle right so there is a, some notion of order but it's also cyclical so that's uh, a type of categorical label value and then uh, there is unstructured categorical values so text um, you know something that's just given a label like um, um, for example toys uh, a group of things right so toys food these could be labels in a in a in a, in a data set the values that you give to something uh, unstructured data so those are categorical values the next type of values are numerical these are very simple anything that's an integer or real uh, because you can do mathematical operations on that so those are numerical in nature but uh, remember um, it's important to uh, understand what these mathematical operations are they have to be all the mathematical operations so you for example you can't um, Uh, you can't uh, multiply. Um, you can't say ten uh, into thirty degrees uh, Fahrenheit is three hundred uh, degrees Fahrenheit. That doesn't. Um, although you can mathematically manipulate the number, the end result is does not make a sense. Make any real world sense. So, uh, but. Um, values that are real or have integers these are uh, considered numerical um, numerical values okay uh, so what are things like fahrenheit and celsius they are usually what we call composites okay uh, currency is a good example there is a symbol and there is a number it means something so it's considered a composite because it uh, adding the currency number or rather the symbol in front of it is what makes it a currency uh, same way with um, Uh, spatial and all these sort of things now you might say well currency is uh, represented by a number that's true uh, the new num- the numerical part of the currency is uh, a numerical value true but the currency itself is actually a composite uh, so it's the pound symbol in front of it or the rupee symbol in front of it that actually gives it a meaning so it's a composite and that's the thing to remember about composite composites are made up of categorical and numerical combined together when these are combined together you get the composite so just remember that so that helps you to avoid lot of confusions around composites because we often represent composites with with numbers right and then we forget that there is um something in front of them uh, or that or something added to it that makes it meaningful a uh, good example is probably 6 feet 3 inches uh, that's a composite uh, structure actually so although it has numerical component to it it does have uh, have a categorical label also that gives it meaning spatial data dates uh, any structured um values like json and xml ip addresses urls phone numbers these are all composite values um these are uh, some sample questions from the uh um, the module itself from the um bottom over here i think so is our research paper structured or semi structured and all this sort of thing the you can say they are semi structured because they have author names so abstracts keywords but most of the content is unstructured inside them but it is semi structured it's got some sort of structure but it's not fully structured book titles categorical or composite and the answer is they are categorical because they don't have an underlying structure um so what's the value of uh, being able to extract data the idea is you get a competitive advantage because the more data you can extract more analysis you can do okay so that covers module 1 any questions so far sir book titles are uh, 
categorical so book structures uh, book titles, book are they titles. yeah so the question is are book titles categorical or composite okay there will be a large number of titles how can we yeah yeah but titles are are, are uh, the domains are uh, genre uh, what we call yeah, but they are not uh, science maths or uh, mythology like that those yeah, categories are uh, titles uh, themselves are ca categorical yeah book titles are categorical right no if we have to argue then phone numbers also can be categorical no 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 phone numbers have a structure right Uh, it's got um, uh, it's comprised of uh, what do you call for that numbers that have been predefined in a particular way right okay you can't do operations on phone numbers can you no even in book titles uh, how can you do operations yeah but that's what i mean you can't uh, so phone numbers have a very so phone numbers structure. first five digits will indicate something yeah exactly like it's got a structure but book titles don't have structure right so sir after we are uh, now phone numbers no structure sir like no, uh, no no phone numbers have structure right they're com they're composites they are made up of numbers that's first thing so there's a numerical component to it but there is also a categorical component okay now I mean, there's an area code. There is. Uh, no, after mobile numbers have come, but no area code is there. Uh, uh, do mobile numbers start with any number? They start with a restricted set, right? In fact, it's very narrowly defined. No, no. If it's a ten-digit number, uh, hmm. well, you see, for uh, narrowly defined means, if it is nine eight, you say it is Airtel. Now, once I. Um, Uh, switch to Jio. I can have the same number, but nine eight uh, is never Airtel. It can be any uh, provider. Yeah, but it probably won't start with three or two or something, right? Have you seen mobile numbers that start there? No, initially, twenty years back, it was only nine. Now we have yeah. eight, seven, six. All numbers mm. are coming. <laughs> okay, but uh, there is still a structure to it. I'll tell you why. Because there is a limit, right? It has can only be so many digits. and it cannot be less than so many digits there is still a structure to it right yeah yeah 10 digits you have to have for a mobile number correct so other number all those things are all structured only yes I mean, they are uh, all yeah. i mean they are all composites i would say okay yeah. don't confuse values and uh, data we are talking about values here phone numbers are composite values okay okay correct Thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, so that was module one, a world world wind tour of uh, module one. Uh, and if you know all this from module one, that's more than sufficient. Okay, you, you won't need to know anything more. So one uh, one ninth of the answer paper has been answered. <laughs> yeah, more or less. Yeah. I mean, you might need to use a, a little bit of thinking for some questions, but uh, yeah, generally that's what it. Is. Okay. Module two, uh, which is called. So the first was data discovery. The next one is data sourcing. Um, three ways to get data. Of course, first way download data. It's readily available. Uh, you know, you go to some data site. They have it all nice and ready for you. So you can just download. It. Second way, you query it from a database. So you can't get the whole table. Uh, like you remember, there were some data sets where you had to. I think it was for Arui. Yeah, for Arui, where you had to query a database. Right? It was in a table. You send a query to it, and then uh, it gets you a response. So you get a subset of the data. So querying it is another way. Our API. You know, uh, you can't get all the data you want in one go. You can query it specifically. So, like that Pokemon API or any other API. Um, so can you please explain something about API? Um, so, so have you? So there is a session we did. Um, um, Some important points regarding that API. I mean, the best thing I can see API. Uh, important points with API. The main thing is if you go to the TDS channel. we did a, a very good session on that um 
and i'm and i'm not saying that because i took the session i'm just saying that because uh, students genuinely found it oops sorry students genuinely found it um, helpful and um, i think it was week 2 yeah it's this week 2 where we covered apis um, and uh, we covered it in good detail over there how apis work uh, and you can also look the immediate um, after that as well which would have been i think it was this session where i might have talked about it again but uh, definitely try check this week out okay it's very useful and not only for apis it's also useful for um, i think i talked about css uh, and things of that sort in there which will be useful for your intern so check that out okay uh, beyond that i don't want to spend too much time on it because um, to talk about the nitty gritty of api we would actually have to look at how an api works how you scrape from it and all that sort of thing. so i don't really want to go into that uh, today because um, we have a limited time left and i want to try and cover as much of the important things as possible but check that out for api okay we uh, share this playlist the playlist is uh, the tts youtube channel so and um okay let me hi so three ways so querying it is the next way and then of course the third way is scraping it your favorite way of getting data right <laughs> so uh, yeah so those are three ways to get data um with regards to using excel you can use excel to get data uh, the way you do it is you choose the data you know in excel you have a data ribbon right uh, let me just launch it really quickly so now in mine it doesn't show all these same options as it does in windows and now you may think oh why are you asking these sort of things uh, the reason it will be it might be in your end term is simply because the video exists right so you can watch the video and learn from the video so even if you don't have excel still expected to know at least this basic thing go to the data ribbon there is a there will be a button that i don't specifically have here uh, but the process is data there will be a button called new query and then from other sources from the web select table view and select the relevant data table so what happens is uh, this is how you extract data from a website into excel so if you go to a website it has a table in there and that table if you want the data from that table uh you use that data ribbon say new query from other sources from the web and then you select the table you actually want to uh get from the website so that's how you use excel to scrape the data okay another way is through using google sheets again there it's all there in the video uh, but the key things to remember from that these are all important okay please please uh learn these okay uh, it's very simple Uh, there are five of them import xml import feed import range import data and import html those are the five okay uh, what i would suggest is um, put them in your uh, uh, in google because it's it's uh, google sheets and just look up how these functions work so understand the syntax it's very easy okay it's not much to remember this little bit you should be able to remember uh, because it was covered in the videos so just learn the i won't go over details of these but just learn the syntax and what it does okay uh, just remember that uh, and uh, so there might be for example a question and i think you have seen it in ga2 for example yeah, let's see here so yeah so j2 they you know they are something like uh, which of these functions can process csv i mean they won't ask this particular question but that's an example of a question they could ask right so if you don't know what these functions do then you will find it difficult to answer this question in the exam and it's an easy mark right so that's why i've told you the important ones xml all of them are important at the front it's xml feed 
range, data, and HTML. Learn the syntax of it. Um, uh, what and what they do. Okay. Then the next thing for module two is this URL encode. So it is a function from the URL lib, uh, URL lib library, uh, and the way you what do you use it for? Um, whenever you want to fetch some data from some uh, website, sometimes you have to encode it with some weird parameters, right? I mean something like this. This is the website, but you have to give it a whole bunch of parameters. And to type all this in can be very error prone and uh, very difficult, right? So instead of writing it out this way, what you would rather do is uh, use this URL and code. And um, the way you do it is, so say for example, that's the URL location. Okay, that's fine. There's a question mark at the end of that, which means you're going to add some parameters. And to this string, you add this function URL encode and you give it a dictionary where you give it the key and the value, key and the value, key and the value. And then it gives you this, which is what you need for your uh, web request. Okay. Uh, so just this function will be important to remember okay, from an exam point of view, URL code and it's from the URL lib library. Uh, next thing to that's valuable to remember is the requests library. What are some of the things to remember in the request library? Um, it's a very straightforward library to use. You say requests uh, and then what method? There's get, post, or delete and all that sort of thing. Uh, how do you uh, learn about it? There is a very good resource. Just remember this, very useful. Uh, and I'll tell you what are some of the key things to remember from it. So from a response that you get, which is what this is, the variable. So when you send this request, uh, you will get a response back from the website. That response will have a status code. That's how you get this, uh, whether it's successful or not, whether the page has been found or not, headers. Uh, and if you want to get the specific header, you can either, it's not case sensitive. So you can either say small c and t, or you can use capital C and T, it makes no difference. You'll still get the same header. Now you can find out the encoding. You can get the text body response, or you can get the JSON body response. Uh, if you had seen my sessions on, uh, on that week two, which I showed you earlier, again, I think I cover all these in there. Uh, so it's a very good session to watch. Um, it will give you some good grounding in that. Um, Another thing I will mention is responses can have cookies, right? Uh, when you're trying to scrape. So cookies, um, if you want to get the cookies, you do r dot cookies and you give the cookie name, you'll get the cookie details. And if you remember, I think Amit covered this in his session, cookies are useful when you want to log into a site and you want to get, um, uh, you want to get the information uh, via the cookie. Right, so uh, just remember that. What's the structure of a cookie? It's a dictionary, key value pair again. So just remember that, that's the uh, structure. So a question that could come theoretically would be, uh, what's the structure of a cookie? So you know, it's a key value pair or a dictionary, okay? I won't go through beautiful soup. We extensively covered this in several sessions. So again, a great resource for that is this, um, I'll copy this, put it in the message. Uh, please uh, bookmark this. This is useful. And then Beautiful Soup also has some very, very excellent documentation. I mean, it really is simple. So uh, I won't be going through the details of this, but valuable. And remember, this is, uh, I'm saying this not because I'm trying to cover everything. I'm trying to give you um, from an end term perspective what you can expect. Okay. Again, with, with these, all these questions, right, with beautiful soup and all, it's not going to be deep. It's going to be on the same level that you've seen so far. You'll just ask some basic, very basic questions. Okay. It won't be very deep. 
So just keep that in mind. The next thing is um, there was a session on JavaScripting, uh, which Anand sir has uh, shown. Um, some of, so what I've done is I've done a very, very brief uh, uh, things to remember from there uh, uh, in the JavaScript. So uh, I hope you remember these things. These are, again, uh, in, covered in the sessions. And anything with a dot means it's a class. Anything with a hash, it means it's an ID. Uh, if it's, um, before I say what copy is. So anyone remember what's dollar dollar is? Can you? Let me know if you remember what dollar dollar means. Get document. Uh, it's a uh, something with document as far as I remember. Okay, so watch the video, and uh, you will see on there what dollar dollar is. It's a uh, it's a shorthand for uh, query selector all something like that, right? So just. Check the video, it will only take you two seconds because it says it at the very, near the very beginning of the video. Uh, but that's dollar dollar is a shorthand way of saying you know, query selector all or something like that. Okay. So, for example, if they ask the question, you at least know what that is. Uh, and then uh, mapping is a programmatic way of um, going through an array and applying some operation to it, right? So, that's a JavaScript function. So just keep that in mind. This is a, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, an arrow arrow function, uh, mean, meaning an anonymous function. Um, so that's what that operator does there. And then this, this operator, question operator, uh, what it does is when it's doing the query, if it doesn't find this, because sometimes uh, when you're going through a list of things, sometimes something may not exist, right? Particularly if it's a list of things. So if it doesn't exist, what this uh, question question mark operator does, it's called a ternary operator. If it exists, it gives you the value. Otherwise, it will say undefined. But the important part is it doesn't throw an error. So if this was not there, for example, if the question mark was not there, so when it's doing the query selector and it's looking for this item and does not find it, if that question mark is not there, it will throw an error. So your script won't uh, work, right? You'll be passing the script and it will throw an error. It won't work. How do you fix that? Because this is optional. If you put the question mark there, it will, uh, if it exists, it will return the value. Otherwise, it will return undefined. But no error will be thrown and your query will uh, continue to execute without any problem. This uh, function will continue to execute. So that's the value of that. And finally, this keyword copy. Uh, what that means is when it runs this query selector, because that's what this is, right? It's running a query. So when it runs a query on the page, copy takes the result of this and stores it in the clipboard. That's what copy does. Okay. So yeah, copy copies it into. That's all you need to know about the JavaScript part of it. Next, uh, nominatum. Okay, there we go. That's better. So, nominatum, what do you need to remember? Uh, can anyone tell me what nominatum is used for? You should know by now. So, locations, uh, latitude, and longitude. Get the coordinates of the. Yeah, it's to get geo data, right, uh, of a particular location. So that's what nominatum is for. How do you use it? Uh, you use it from the GeoPy. Um, uh, using GeoPy, uh, you you import geo, you import nominatum from there. And then, uh, how do you use it? You have to give it a user agent, and uh, you have to use this function, geocode, and then give it some uh, location. So that's how you use it. Uh, apart from this, um, what does it provide? It provides all sorts of data, longitude, latitude, uh, what kind of place it is, you know, whether it's a university or some tourist place or something. It'll give you some data. Other than longitude and latitude, it gives you a lot of rich data. I think there are like seven or eight fields. It, it even gives you altitude, I think, or something like that. So it gives you lots of different information about the place. Okay, so that's about nominal. 
Wikipedia. So there is a Wikipedia library. Okay. Uh, what does it do? It's to basically search for things on Wikipedia. So uh, just uh, I haven't listed out all the important things. I mean, as in I haven't listed out all the things it does, but it's very small documentation. Okay. Uh, just uh, how to search, how to find suggestions, um, and you can see it. Get one sentence or some small amounts of get to get a summary, that sort of thing. So that's really all you need to know about it. Not, nothing much from this, okay? But just uh, if they ask a question, at least you'll be able to answer it. Uh, tabula is used for uh, getting uh, information from PDFs, scraping information from PDFs. This is used for scraping information from Wikipedia. Uh, tabula has mainly two functions. The read PDF function, uh, you give it the PDF, tell the page, and it has a convert, uh, which is once it reads the PDF, you want to convert it to a CSV. You take that uh, data that it has read, uh, it, give it the name of the CSV file you want to send it to, tell it the format. And uh, another thing it can do is it can look at a particular area in a, in a file, right? So if it's got to look at a table in a particular part of the PDF, then you can give it a, a, some coordinates of that place. Okay, so that's the only two functions in Tabula. That's it. That's module two. That's uh, generally all you need to know about module two. Any questions? I know I'm going quite fast, but um, I hope um, it's clear so far. Sir, why only these are covered in live sessions instead of uh, regular videos? Sorry, I didn't quite understand that question. Some of the topics are not covered in regular uh, videos in detail. They are covered in the live sessions like uh, we have taken. Oh, um, I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> but generally, that's how TDS has been run so far. It's uh, usually in live sessions that we cover how to. Because you are also uh, student once upon. Yeah, I, I think it's know, part. You know yeah. what is the difficulty in coordinating mm. all these things? I think it's partly because TDS is a very practical course. So when you have live sessions, then uh, we are able to uh, discuss the tool in detail and demonstrate it uh, and answer students' questions while we are demonstrating the. So in our Python, in the first term, uh, it is also a practical approach and it is covered in detail how to program approach should be taken how to code yeah but there is one big difference though uh, in tds we cover a vast number of tools python is just one topic right i mean basically it's one language right so that's that's the that's the reason okay uh, one more module to go then we'll finish uh, so, any questions so far about module two? Okay. Module three. So, what you need to know in module three? So, first of all, what is module three? Module three is data preparation. So, you've discovered the data, you know about sources and know about data. You know how to get the data now. Uh, if you remember, I talked about it here. Three, three ways to get it downloading querying it and scraping it and then um, now we are going to prepare the data so um, again I, I although we are going through it doing a review please watch the videos okay uh, it will help you remember the things we've done in the review and um, so uh, just go through the videos when you have a chance but if you don't have time, then this hopefully this review will give, be good enough for you guys to get reasonable, quite good marks, I would expect. So preparing the data. One way is to use Excel. Uh, what to remember in Excel? Uh, there are several functions in Excel. I won't go through the, the silly ones, OK? There are some silly functions in Excel, uh, but I'll go through some of the important trim function. Can anyone quickly tell me what trim does? It removes spaces. Yeah, so it removes any excess spaces. Uh, when I say access, 
uh, that doesn't mean all the spaces. If there is, so for example, one space between two words, it won't remove that. Right? It will remove only the. If there are three, four spaces between a word, then it will remove those. Okay, for trim function, uh, unless you give it some extra parameters, I think. But uh, check it out. Uh, look, uh, go on Google and put in Excel trim and just learn about that function. Uh, second, how to uh, delete blank rows from your file. Uh, or rather not blank rows but you know certain uh, columns there may be a bit of blank data right sometimes we say say when we are scraping or not scraping when we are giving you projects we say ignore nulls or something like that right how do you remove blank rows you go in excel say find select go to special blank and then once you get that it will highlight all the blank rows so i mean if you go like this and say um, I think it's uh, what's it called find right find find and uh, I'm not sure if it shows up in mine. No, so I think it's in the Windows version probably. Anyway, in the video it is there. Sorry, someone was saying something. Uh, but if you go, if you look on the video, you'll see this. Uh, find in the find and select. There's a go to special button, and in there, there's blank. You can select blank, and it will select all the rows. So it's uh, row 13 and row 21 and row 25 have some blanks in like column F. It will highlight those rows, and uh, then you'll be able to delete all those rows in one go. Okay, so that's the process. Just remember that. Uh, next, how to remove duplicates? You just go to data, data ribbon, and there will be a, a button somewhere that says remove duplicates. Um, I don't know if it doesn't show here because I don't have data. Maybe that's why it doesn't show. Maybe it's context sensitive. But uh, go to data, and in there, there will be a button that says remove duplicates. So that's how you remove uh, duplicates from those. Okay. So those are important Excel functions, and there are some other small ones that you can see in the video. But these are the important ones. Then uh, the next thing is um, there was a video on. If I go up, right, so that was this video. Clean up Excel. Uh, yeah, find and replace, change date formats. Uh, just go through that it's very straightforward data transformation in excel i'm not going to cover because um, it's something that will take a take some time you need uh, data to look at basically it's about using pivot tables uh, how to filter data you should already be know how to do all these things uh, i think it's extensively covered in bdm and other things so and it's very easy to do so i'm not going to cover this uh, uh, convert text to columns in Excel. Okay, uh, it's just one function. Uh, just learn how to do it. Data aggregation in Excel. Um, again, I'm not really going to cover this. Um, just have a look at the video. It's very easy to do. Uh, so uh, just be aware that these things are possible in Excel. Okay, and how you how you might go about them. In data preparation in the sh in the shell. Uh, just learn what these functions are. Okay? We're not going to ask you any complicated thing to do. You're not going to say, uh, okay, here is some file. Um, how do you do this? We were not going to ask any of that because you've already been given graded assignments that test you on these things. But just be aware of what these functions are and what they do. So if you know this much, that's more than sufficient. Okay? We are not going to test you on complex usage of this. Just know what they are and what they do. So for example, then we may ask like, how do you get the start and end of a file in uh, in the shell? So you can say, use the head function or the tail function. Uh, or maybe they might ask a little bit of syntax, but nothing much more than that, okay? So that's for that. And uh, then, um, let's see. Data preparation in the editor I won't cover. Um, that is um, something you can check out yourselves. Cleaning data with open refine. Um, 
just know what these terms mean faceting uh, clustering methodologies just know what those terms mean um, there are some few algorithms that uh, they use in there uh, so that's with open data refine uh, don't worry about uh, much of these things uh, know what correlation and what these terms might mean uh, but beyond that there's nothing much more uh, this python pillow image manipulation i think there are like four functions that he mentions in this video um, it's very simple functions uh, that is covered in the documentation i believe um, i think one was very converted it the other one was very resized it and uh, cropped it only the basic things don't worry about this documentation just uh, in this video the, i think there are like four functions he goes uh, that's about enough don't worry beyond that and uh, that about covers this and also know what what this is used for what pillow is used for pillow is used for image manipulation what airflow is used for it is uh, used for um, uh, basically to connect uh, data sets uh, through a pipeline so you can have a quick overview of what that is and that's it nothing deep about this okay we are not going to ask any deep questions we won't ask you how it is used uh, and all that sort of thing just know what it's used for okay that's about it so that covers the three modules if you know this much right you can easily and if the if the question paper was only for these three modules uh, just if you know this much is sufficient for you to get like top marks in the exam okay so that's uh, those are the three modules i hope the session was useful again i know it's not very interesting because it's we are doing it from an exam point of view rather than uh, a knowledge learning point of view so it's not going to be the most exciting thing in the world uh, but if you want to learn more obviously you can watch our ta sessions that we have done earlier we have done a fairly comprehensive look at some of these things where we have not just uh, done exam prep but uh, we have actually taught you so that is useful to you. <laughs> wow there's lots of clapping <laughs> okay right so that's that's it guys that's it for today any questions please feel free to ask yeah pranjil go ahead or oh, pranil sorry um, yes sir, no questions but like sir, i was going to the mumbai queues like today afternoon okay and then i realized like being discussed in the lecture is exactly like similar to what was in the pyq like i was trying to analyze what types of questions are asked in the pyq so, okay. like, i figured out it was more like what tools are there what they used for how they used for and all the about yes. so like the, the session was really helpful okay yeah that's great i'm glad uh, you guys found it helpful so we did Thank the you. quiz so uh, did were you able to do the mock that was uh, done earlier um like i scored 22 but like some of them were multiple correct right so like sure, sure. yeah yeah okay great so that's it guys um, yeah anyone else has any questions or any suggestions uh, or... not related this uh, regarding project uh, i have some okay please uh, if you stop the recording i will ask it oh right right okay um, yeah that's it so i'll stop uh, recording because um, there's nothing else uh, that's important for today